So let us resume our discussion of uh, the velocity process for a Brownian particle in a fluid and just to recapitulate very quickly what we uh, discovered, we found that uh, when the particle obeys the Langevin equation, then its velocity process, this random process driven by white noise, Gaussian white noise is exponentially correlated. So we discovered that this quantities V of T naught, V of T naught plus T was a function only of the time difference T between these two arguments and this was essentially equal to K V T over M e to the minus gamma, gamma T this fashion. So I might as well set T naught equal to 0 and write it as V of 0 V of T equal to K V T over m e to the minus gamma t. Now we also saw, I am not sure if we proved this, but we also saw using stationarity that this very trivially implies if I subtract minus t from each of these arguments, this also implies that v of minus t v of 0, if I set t to minus t here is going to give us a modulus there. So in general, it is clear that this quantity satisfies this uh, expression. Okay. So it is a symmetric function in T and it dies down exponentially on either side of the T axis okay, in equilibrium. We further saw as a consequence of this, by the way this implies that there is a time scale in the problem gamma inverse which we could actually estimate by using the fact that we, if we put this uh, particle in a fluid with viscosity eta for instance and it has a radius r, then we saw that uh, m times gamma was equal to 6 pi r eta where this is the viscosity of the fluid and this is the mass of the particle and if you estimate this mass to be of the order of 10 to the minus 15 kilograms, gamma turns out to be of the order of 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 7 second inverse. So gamma inverse turns out to be about 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 7, r micron size particle 10 to the minus 6, eta is 10 to the minus 3 in SI units, standard international units, Newton second per meter squared or something like that. Then we discovered that uh, there is a time scale in the problem which is of the order of microseconds or tens of microseconds and you must compare it to the other time scales in the problem. The other time scale we have is the actual interaction time between molecules and that is of the order of uh, 10 to the minus 15 seconds or less and then there is a time scale between collisions of particles that is of the order of picoseconds or less and this time scale is another 6 orders of magnitude higher. Now of course you can consider times much much greater than gamma inverse and that is the diffusion regime in which the mean square displacement of the particle goes linearly in time with a diffusion constant this coefficient d given by kt over m gamma. The diffusion coefficient of this massive particle in the fluid not of individual molecules there. We also discovered as a consequence of this expression we could actually write down what the displacement did, the mean square displacement did and we found that if you define an x of t to be equal to uh, little x of t minus x of 0 and you computed the mean square value of this quantity x squared of t, not the conditional mean but the actual mean of this quantity, you computed the full equilibrium average value of this quantity, then this uh, turned out to be um, k b t over m gamma squared times gamma t minus 1 plus e to the minus gamma t. That was the exact expression and all we needed was to use the fact that the position is the integral of the velocity. 
and that is it. So, with that we immediately got an expression which went like this. This of course goes for gamma t much much greater than 1 to twice dt where d is given by this expression here. In other words that is the diffusion regime but for all time it is exactly equal to this in this model as far as this model goes. Now you can ask further questions of this you could ask what does this quantity itself do for instance and what is its average value and so on. You can I am going to leave this as an exercise just one step first step for instance if you compute what is x bar of t this is the conditional average the conditional average for a given v naught and a given x of 0 then this is easy to find notice that uh, a, a simple integration immediately gives you x of t is equal to an integral from 0 to t dt1 v of t1 and we know what v of t1 does the conditional average this quantity v of t1 bar is equal to v naught e to the minus gamma t plus a portion that depends on the initial uh, depends on the random force the eta and that average is to 0. So, if I compute this integral here this thing becomes equal to all that I need to do is to plug this in v naught over gamma 1 minus e to the minus gamma t. All I have done is to substitute this expression here and compute it here and this is equal to x bar of t. So, the average value the conditional average of the displacement is this quantity here. Of course, if I take a full average now over v naught it will vanish as it should the displacement should vanish. Having got this you can now ask what is the variance of this quantity not of this quantity itself but of the deviation of this quantity from its mean. So, the natural definition of delta x of t capital X of t would of course be x of t minus the average value the conditional average of x of t that is obviously the natural definition of the deviation from the mean of the displacement not the position but the displacement itself. And then one can ask what is delta x of t whole squared the full average. You have to take this quantity square it in the usual way and take the full average. If you use this fact what we need is information about this x bar of t obviously in this expression and we use that information in then it is not hard to show that this becomes equal to d over gamma times oh incidentally we could also have written this as d over gamma times gamma t minus 1 plus gamma e to the minus gamma t I substitute d equal to kt over m gamma. So, if I do the same thing here for this uh, variance then this is equal to this turns out to be equal to uh, no, not sure if I remember this expression completely but let us see if I can mentally write this out. Uh, uh, 2 gamma t minus 3 plus 4 e to the minus gamma t yeah, I remember that part of it minus e to the minus 2 gamma t which comes from squaring this fellow okay. So, you get some expression like that for the variance of this displacement itself of course as t tends to infinity this will go to 2 dt as it should okay. So, if you are interested in the displacement rather than the velocity we have this expression here. Now, what is interesting is that there is no simple equation as there will be will be for the velocity process there will be some kind of equation we will talk about this equation which will give the distribution and probability of the conditional uh, density of the, the conditional probability <coughs> density of the velocity we are going to write that down shortly but there is no such equation for this. However, the very fact that the velocity is just the, the, the position is the integral of the velocity helps you to find these things these quantities here. 
you could in fact go on to find delta x of t1 and delta x of t delta x of t prime it is a messy expression of some kind. So we can play with this find all these moments explicitly but let us come back here backtrack a little bit and say all right this is very nice can we say something about the probability density of v the actual distribution of this velocity as a function of time the conditional distribution starting from the fact that it uh, the at t equal to 0 it is a delta function at some v naught and then t tends to infinity it should go to the Maxwellian distribution. Can we write this distribution down? We are going to do that a little later when I show you that there is a correspondence between the Langevin equation for the variable itself and an equation called the Fokker-Planck equation for the conditional probability density. There is a complete one to one correspondence in certain cases and we will exploit that. But right now I want to write the answer down and introduce you to this distribution which you would have seen in other contexts perhaps but let me show you what this distribution is. We can simply write it down in this particular case and it is as follows. So remember what we know about this velocity. We know that it is a stationary process in equilibrium because it is a function of t alone. In fact you can show that it is stationary in the strict sense in other words all its densities joint densities are independent of the origin of time you can shift the time. At this level it is only the correlation the two point correlation that has been shown to be so but this is true for all its uh, joint distributions. We know for instance that V of t average is V naught e to the minus gamma t the conditional average for a given V naught. We know that V squared of t average we had an expression for this quantity we know that it is V naught squared 1 minus e to the minus 2 gamma t. If I take it is sorry this average if I square if I take the average with respect to V naught there was an extra term here you have to remind me what this term is uh, there was an extra term which also had this plus uh, what was the actual expression we found out otherwise I have to now go back and start working out the algebra what was the actual expression. Uh, as t tends to infinity so well perhaps this was correct average of v naught squared is k b t over m so that is ok that is what it was explicitly ok right. But we also put in uh, I am a little unhappy about this what I would like to know what I would like to do is write down what is the variance of this quantity the conditional variance. What was the actual expression for this quantity? Is this correct as it stands? Yes. So we had two terms, one involving gamma. Yes. Uh, it was v naught square minus gamma upon 2 m square gamma times e power minus 2 gamma t. V naught squared? Minus? V naught squared e to the minus 2 gamma t. Minus? Uh, yeah, plus? plus capital gamma upon 2 m gamma square m square gamma into 1 minus uh, 2 m square gamma no v naught square in the no v naught square yeah. it is gamma upon 2 m square gamma into times 1 minus e power minus 2 gamma <coughs> good that is right. So this is equal to could we wrote this as by the way this quantity we know there is a fluctuation dissipation relation so it is k t over m so it is k Boltzmann t over m plus 
V naught squared minus K Boltzmann T over M e to the minus 2 gamma T good. So that was the expression so let us kill this and this was V squared of T average exactly exactly. Now we argued that if you let T go to infinity for a fixed T naught start with for a fixed origin on time then this term goes away and it reaches the equilibrium value. On the other hand if you average this quantity with respect to the Maxwellian distribution in V naught then this gives you a KT over M and that kills this and there is nothing to average here so it remains KT over M. This was our consistency condition right. So now given these two we can compute what is V squared of T minus V of V of T average squared this is equal to conditional variance of V and what is this equal to what we need to do is take this and subtract from this the square of this quantity and that kills this term here. So this is equal to K Boltzmann T over M 1 minus e to the minus 2 gamma t. So we have the conditional mean and we got the conditional variance. Now if and this is a big if this process is a Gaussian and remains Gaussian at all times we know at t equal to infinity it is a Gaussian it is the Maxwellian distribution right. If it remains a Gaussian at all times then we can actually write the distribution down and what distribution would that be it is the conditional probability density. So P of Vt given V0 this is the conditional PDF of velocity it is conditioned upon this specific initial condition starts with the delta function at v equal to v naught as t tends to infinity it goes to the Maxwell distribution in v and now the question is what is it actually equal to well if it is a Gaussian if it is a Gaussian then the mean and variance determine the distribution completely a Gaussian is determined by its mean and variance completely right. So if that is so then apart from a normalization factor if is a Gaussian and we have to show this but we will do so later on then P of V T V naught is actually equal to apart from a normalization factor e to the power minus V minus V naught e to the minus gamma T the whole squared that is the Gaussian up there divided by twice the variance so it is minus m over twice k Boltzmann t 1 minus e to the minus 2 gamma t that is the exponential and all we have to do is to normalize this exponential which is m over 2 pi k Boltzmann t 1 minus e to the minus 2 gamma t to the power a half exponential of this whole thing in brackets. So let me write it out neatly this is exponential of minus m v minus v naught e to the minus gamma t whole squared over k Boltzmann t twice k Boltzmann t 1 minus e to the that tells you that this distribution in V P of V T V naught starts with the delta function at V naught at any intermediate time it looks like this a peak at this point V naught e to the minus gamma t and a width that is growing all the time because as t increases 
this quantity decreases till at t equal to infinity it reaches its value of 2 k t largest value of 2 k t twice the variance and then it becomes a symmetric Gaussian up here. So, it eventually ends up with this at t equal to infinity. This is called the Ornstein, it is the Ornstein Ullenbeck probability density function. And the general statement which I made as a statement is that if you have a continuous stationary Gaussian Markov process then it is exponentially correlated and then it looks like this in general. Okay. We wrote this for the velocity based on the Langevin equation and the assumption that it remains a Gaussian but this is in fact a Gauss Markov process a prototypical Gauss Markov process. So, with that statement in place and I tell you it is Markov then all moments are known everything is known about it completely. Later we will little later we will derive the Fokker Planck equation or at least justify the Fokker Planck equation from which this of which this is going to be the solution appropriate solution ok. For that initial condition. For, for that given initial <coughs> condition yes absolutely. So, it is essentially telling you how does the probability density function itself relax to the equilibrium value. So, that is the crucial point about this. Okay. Having done that and talked a little bit about the displacement, let us do the following. The next question to ask natural question would be to say if we push this Langevin model a little further then we also need to be able to say what is the joint distribution of the position and the velocity in phase space or the position and the momentum. But I am not going to do that right now because it is a lot easier to do that in terms of the distribution function itself for which I would need something called the Fokker Planck equation corresponding to that uh, two dimensional process. So, I have not justified that yet I have not come to that yet. So, meanwhile before we do that we are going to do a lot of other things. So, let me keep that in abeyance for the moment because it will become easier to understand later on and go back now and look at a three dimensional case just to show you that the velocity correlation function can actually mix up uh, different components of the velocity if for instance you have a magnetic field. So, let us look at this very simple problem it is actually quite a simple problem of a Langevin particle in a magnetic field that problem too can be solved quite exactly. a constant magnetic field and I want to look at the simplest case where this particle is placed in a constant magnetic field in this fluid and everything else remains exactly the same. Again I say this uh, model which is the Langevin model for the particle I write its equation of motion but this time including the Lorentz force on the particle the V cross B force ok. So, the mass is M the particle mass equal to m charge equal to q and the magnetic field applied is some b which is in some arbitrary direction defined by some unit vector m ok. We could without loss of generality take this n to be along the z direction but there is no reason to let us just look at it for arbitrary n a little more algebra but it is helpful to separate then the transverse and the longitudinal components easily ok. Now, I am going to cut this uh, story short and do it in the following way. We will use physical arguments here to make certain assumptions which are actually justifiable completely rigorously. First of all the fluid is in thermal equilibrium at temperature T ok. Now, this particle all the other assumptions in the absence of the field continue to hold good. So, the distribution of velocity of this particle in equilibrium is not going to be different from the Maxwellian. In thermal equilibrium nothing happens because the magnetic field does no work on this particle at all. 
it does not change its energy and if it does not change its energy it remains in the canonical ensemble the equilibrium distribution is still going to be exactly the Maxwellian distribution. On the other hand if I start with some given initial velocity V naught in some arbitrary direction then there is a question as to how it relaxes to this equilibrium distribution. What how do the components different components relax? We will continue to assume without or with some intuition that the velocity remains a stationary process. Okay. The different Cartesian components of the velocity may be correlated, we do not know yet, we are going to find this correlation. So, let us compute the correlation function directly and let us do it in the case of the magnetic field assuming that the system remains in thermal equilibrium and moreover that this velocity is a stationary process, this is all we need. Then we could have computed in the absence of the field by a, sh a slight shortcut. So, let me do that with the presence of the field and you will see how this calculation goes. So, the Langevin equation that I write for it is m times let us look at some given Cartesian component j of t v j dot of t j is one of the Cartesian components runs over 1 2 3 ok. This is equal to minus m gamma v j of t the same gamma I assume the fluid is isotropic gamma de depends on the viscosity of the fluid it is completely isotropic exactly the same in all Cartesian components. And then there is a portion there is a random force as usual, but there is also a term which is the V cross B term. So, there is a Q times epsilon J K L V K B L which is N L, but let us put a B outside. I assume you are familiar with the index notation and with this uh, epsilon symbol which is a short way of writing the cross product V cross B. This quantity is equal to plus 1 if J K L are in the order 1, 2, 3 or permutation cyclic permutations thereof minus 1 if they are not and any 2 indices are equal it is equal to 0 right. So, the technical way of saying it is epsilon j k l is plus 1 if j k l is an even permutation of 1, 2, 3 the natural order minus 1 if it is an odd permutation and 0 in all other cases ok. Plus there is the force here now which is eta j of t it is a vector force so I write it is j comma and let us as usual divide by m. So, this is 1 over m you have q b over m this fashion this goes off this goes off ok. It is convenient to write this as minus gamma v j of t minus uh, this quantity q b over m has a physical interpretation it is a quantity of dimensions frequency or inverse time same as gamma that is dimensionless this is dimensionless that is called dimensions velocity. Now, what is what do you call this quantity? It is the cyclotron frequency. So, omega c equal to cyclotron frequency q b over m. So, let us write this as minus omega c m uh, epsilon k j l n l v k. v k is a function of t of course plus 1 over m eta j of t. And let me define a matrix let us define a tensor of rank 2 which you can write as a matrix if you like. Let us define m define m k j l to be equal to epsilon k j l times n l. L is contracted so sorry so this cannot m k j on this side. So, the kj element of this tensor of rank 2 or matrix 3 by 3 matrix 
is defined to be k j l n l. Therefore, I can remove this and write this as m m j k times v k. Now, to find the correlation function, we have assumed that the velocity, we are going to assume the velocity is a stationary process. Then, a quick way of finding the correlation function is to write let us let us pre multiply both sides by v i of 0 v j and take average equilibrium average. We can go through the rigmarole of solving this equation taking conditional average and then taking full averages etcetera showing it stationary and so on. Let us cut all that uh, short just multiply by v i of 0 t is greater than 0 here v j dot of t equal to whatever. This is equal to minus gamma and then I go ahead and take averages v i of 0 v j of t minus omega c average volume of v i of 0 v k of t times m j k. Notice that m is a constant matrix all its elements are constants plus average value v i of 0 eta j of t 1 over m. But this is 0 by causality because for all t greater than 0 this thing is not vanishes identically for all t greater than 0 by causality for all t greater than 0 this thing here vanishes because the effect cannot precede the cause. Okay. What the random force done does at some time t greater than 0 cannot affect what the velocity was at t before 0. So that is it this equation. Now unlike the previous case where you had a correlation function now you got a correlation matrix because there is these symbols ij the, the indices ij etc. So let us define c ij of t to be equal to v i of 0 v j of t. In, this form. Okay. in fact, let us do the following. We know that asymptotically, asymptotically, if i is equal to j, this quantity here is going to die down exponentially, and at t equal to 0, it is going to start with kt over m, the average value is going to start with the average value of v naught squared, which is kt over m. So, let us divide this by kt over m. we will define a normalized correlation matrix by dividing by this asymptotic this initial value k t over m. So, c i j of 0 is equal to 1 by definition. So, let us keep that in mind. If i is not equal to j then these two are uncorrelated at t equal to at the same time. But if i is equal to j then you just get v squared one component and that is equal to kt over m the average value. So, if I write this c of 0 as a c of t as a matrix call it some matrix with component c i j then at t equal to 0 the matrix is the unit matrix that is the delta function is just this is these are just the elements of the unit matrix. So, that is a useful thing to know. So, now we can solve this equation we can solve this equation because it simply says d over dt c i j of t is equal to minus gamma c i j of t minus omega c m we should be careful with the commutation m i k uh, c i k i k of t 
थी एम जे इज दट करेक्ट एम एम सॉरी वी हैड एम जे के what happened here uh, did i define you flipped a thing to change a sign i flipped it to say change the sign and then i brought this uh, it you can change your definition of mk i should do that if you i should really that. do that properly uh, jkl is okay nl uh, mm. Just define that as MJK because there's no error. Yeah, there's no error. So let's. Did I get this right? Yeah. This was correct. This part is okay. So this is M. KJ. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I wrote this term. Sorry. I wrote this term as minus omega c epsilon KJL. Bk, and I define epsilon m k j as epsilon k j l n l. So this fellow here was an m k j. Yeah. K j. That's what it was, and this is m k j. you could do it by defining it any way but you like but now it's consistent yeah this is therefore mkj kj thank you okay or in matrix form this is the same as saying d over dt c of t where this is a matrix c of t is a correlation matrix is equal to minus gamma times the unit matrix plus omega c times the matrix m on is that correct uh, no 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 c times the whole thing so c times yeah minus c times gamma times the unit matrix plus omega c times the m matrix Yeah, now we are in good shape. Is there a reason to have it on the right side? You should either have it on the left or right. That's all. Otherwise, it doesn't matter at all. But I should be careful where I put this C. So this, I, where I write the solution. So this is minus C of T times this fellow. This is a matrix. M is a matrix. This is a unit matrix. It's a matrix equation. Hmm? But This is a constant matrix. There's no time dependence here. This follow here. So this immediately implies that the solution is C of t is equal to e to the power minus ah uh, is equal to C of zero times e to the power minus gamma times the unit matrix plus omega C times m times t. i have to be consistent this c is on the left of this thing here so in the solution 2 it's on the left in the present case it doesn't matter why is that c of 0 is the identity matrix it commutes with everything so we don't really care but it's just good discipline it won't may not always be the case so we should just be careful doing that so that's the solution for c and all you got to do is to read off this matrix but you have the problem of exponentiating this so by the way if, since this is equal to the identity matrix this implies that the whole thing is equal to this implies c of t implies c of t equal to e to the minus gamma t times e to the minus omega c uh, minus m omega c so we have to find the exponential of m times a constant that's all we have to do and then the problem is solved hmm? now how do we go about doing that 
this is a 3 by 3 matrix. If it were a 2 by 2 matrix, we could write it in the Pauli basis in terms of Pauli matrices and we can read off what the exponential is. Right? But it is a 3 by 3 matrix. What should we do then? Uh, yeah, there are several tricks to do this. One of them could be the following. We could, we could take this matrix M. Mm, it is a 3 by 3 matrix, right? Now, it is clear that the exponential of a 3 by 3 matrix cannot, you have to be, you should be able to sum this thing reasonably if this has got some physical meaning and so on. But writing down an explicit formula may not be all that easy. Mm. You can write this exponential down because its characteristic equation after all must be a third order polynomial in M which means that M cube can be written in terms of the identity matrix M and M squared. Therefore, M4 can be written in terms of these follows and so on and so forth. But there will be a pain in the neck to try to combine the coefficients and compute what it is. Not doable in general, but this matrix is so simple that it is possible to do it. Well, another way to do this could be find its eigenvalues, therefore write its characteristic equation down, the secular equation and replace lambda by the matrix itself by the Cayley Hamilton theorem and then maybe one can find out what m cubed is in an easy way. But there is an easy, even easier way. This is a rotation matrix. I hope you recognize this is a rotation matrix. So, m squared kj equal to m kj equal to epsilon kj l n l. This is a unit vectors component. So, m squared kj is equal to epsilon uh, it is equal to m k k r m r j where r is another index. So, this is equal to epsilon k r l n l epsilon r j s n s. that is what it is, right. So, this is equal to epsilon k r l epsilon j r s n l n a s with a minus sign. I flip this once here and then I use this identity well known identity when you take this epsilon symbol and you contract one of the symbols in the same position, then it is just a product of delta functions. So, this is equal to minus of delta k j delta no what did I do? No, no, no this is equal to minus epsilon r k l epsilon r j s n l n s. So, this is equal to a delta function of these two fellows k j delta function of l s minus delta function of k with s delta function of l with j acting on n l n s which is equal to what? The first term you have a delta k j delta l s n l n n s is n l n l which is equal to 1 it is a unit vector and the other term is plus wherever l appears replace with j wherever s appears replace with k. So, n j n k. So, it is just n j n k we have taken got the k j element. So, let us write it symmetrically n k n j minus delta k j that is the square of this matrix. Are we done once you say it is a rotation matrix because it's not, how many people know that it is a rotation matrix? Okay. They are not going to believe you or me. <laughs> 
it's it's a rotation matrix we know it's eigen, what do you think its eigen values are it's a rotation matrix in three dimensions and it's got it's a rotation about the direction l the index l right so it must it's clear that nl must be an eigen vector of this matrix with eigen value equal to 1 can't be so if it's a rotation matrix then there are two other eigen values can either of them be real or must they be imaginary Well, suppose it is real, then this means if this eigenvalue is real, then there is a direction in space which is also left invariant by this rotation. But in a three dimensional rotation, there is only one axis that can at best be left invariant, right. So the other two eigenvalues must be complex, it is a rotation matrix. So this matrix is unitary, it is orthogonal, the elements are real, therefore it is orthogonal. Unitary matrix with real elements, it is an orthogonal matrix. Because it is a unitary matrix, all its eigenvalues must lie on the unit circle. 1 is already an eigenvalue, minus 1 is not an eigenvalue of this. This is immediately why is that? Why is that? Hmm? Yeah, my, if my the product of all the three eigenvalues must be equal to the determinant of this matrix which must be plus 1, it is a proper rotation, right. So if minus 1 appears as an eigenvalue, it must appear second time too because 1 is already an eigenvalue, hmm? right. So it must be a repeated eigenvalue. Okay. It also means that there is again a real eigenvector, a real eigenvalue will imply, hmm? I leave you to figure out why minus 1 cannot appear as an eigenvalue. So the only other possibility is some e to the i theta appears and e to the minus i theta. 2 minus 1 huh? 2 minus 1, yeah. They have to give an argument as to why 2 minus 1s do not appear here for a real rotation matrix. In this case, in this case in three dimensional rotation. Huh? So the only other possibility is a pair of complex, uh, complex conjugate roots which lie on the unit circle. In this case there will be pi over 2 minus pi over 2 e to the i pi over 2, e to the minus i pi over 2. Look at it this way, once you have this direction n l, regard that as a z direction, then a rotation about it is a rotation in the x y plane which is given by matrix of the form cos theta sin theta minus, minus sin theta cos theta and its eigenvalues are e to the plus minus i theta. So that is all it is in this case. Anyway, we are going to discover the same thing in, so this is m, m m squared kj, so implies m cubed kj therefore equal to m squared k uh, r m r j and that is equal to what? m squared k r is n k n r minus delta k r times epsilon r j l n l. What does that work out to? What is the first term? n k n r n l epsilon r j l. Why is it 0? It is symmetric and r and l, n r n l, but there is an epsilon here which is anti-symmetric in the 2, so the first term is 0. So the second term tells you that m cubed kj equal to the second term is a delta where this is replaced here so it is epsilon kj l n a minus m kj minus m kj hmm? so this implies that m cubed equal to minus m. Now that is very simple. Hmm? By the way, that also tells you the characteristic equation right away. If I, the Cayley Hamilton equation would be m times m squared plus i times m equal to 0, 
that is the Cayley Hamilton equation for this case because it is a characteristic equation where you replace the eigenvalue by the matrix. Once I write by the way this is the statement that m cubed is minus m once I write it like this it means that lambda squared plus 1 times lambda equal to 0 which means lambda is equal to either. you have your 3 eigenvalues in this problem okay. All right. Once we yeah. Once we have this, the exponential is very easy. So now let's go back and do what's the exponential in this case. And now we can do this very fast. So this says e to the minus m omega c t equal to i minus m omega c t plus m squared over two factorial omega c t whole squared minus m cubed over 3 factorial omega c t cube plus m 4 over 4 factorial omega c t to the power 4 minus dot 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 dot. This is equal to i let us collect all these terms together minus m omega c t that is this portion and then an m cubed but m cubed is minus m. So this becomes a plus out here. So this gives you m times omega c t and this becomes a plus. So this has to be a minus out there that term is going to keep going in this fashion. And then you have to deal with this fellow plus m squared over 2 factorial <coughs> omega c t whole squared plus m 4 and what is m 4? It is equal to m times m cubed but m cubed is minus m. So this is minus omega c t whole uh, to the power 4 over 4 factorial. plus dot 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 this keeps going this way. If I had a 1 here hmm, then this would be a cosine so let us add and subtract the 1. this came with a plus sign right. So let us put a minus 1 here and put a plus 1. This fellow is minus cosine of omega c t and there was a 1 here that is the identity matrix in this problem. So we have done the job this here now. is equal to i plus 1 minus cos omega c t m squared but before let us write the m term first uh, i minus m sin omega c t plus m squared 1 minus cos that is the final answer. Therefore, the correlation matrix itself, the normalized correlation matrix itself C of t equal to e to the minus gamma t times this. And notice as t goes to 0, this disappears, that disappears, you are left with this times the unit matrix. This is 1. Okay. Right. So, let me stop here since we have run out of time. But let us take it from this point onwards. Now I request you to write down what Cij is. It will of course start with e to the minus gamma t and then you have to write down whatever it is inside. What do you get from here? Delta Ij. What is this? Epsilon I 
j l or i j k if you like hmm? n k sin omega c t plus m squared but remember we have a formula for the components of m squared this fellow here was n uh, i n j minus delta i j 1 minus cos omega c t. This delta i j will cancel against that delta i j. This n i n j will sit as it is here and there is a delta i j which also multiplies this. So, what is this equal to? We can also write this as e to the minus gamma t n i n j that is the first term and then uh, uh, so there is uh, plus uh, correct me if I am wrong here delta i j well work this out explicitly I do not want to make a mistake in writing this expression. But you notice that there is a portion which is odd in time and a portion which is even in time. We will interpret this, we will interpret what this whole thing is. All this is for t greater than 0. Okay. So there is certainly a part which mixes up the components of the velocity. This thing scrambles it up here and we will interpret each of these terms. So, we start with this expression next time and see where this gets us and also try to see what happens as t becomes less than 0. We can write it down from here using physical arguments. We'll do this. Then the next step would be to use the Kubo formula to get the diffusion tensor. So, we do that and see what the transverse and longitudinal displacement uh, diffusion coefficients are after which we will take up linear response theory and then come back to this once we have studied what the general formalism is a little bit. So, let me stop here now.